Sharon and I requested that first song, God of the City. We had a nice youth group in our church in Ohio, and we sang that song a lot. And, and um, I have to say something, and um, I can get caught up in it too. Uh, in Minnesota, we're kind of weaklings. We're kind of quitters. Uh, we lived in Ohio for seven years, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, where I, I used to joke when we drove through Columbus, I'd say, you know, uh, the worst neighborhood in Columbus, I mean, the, the worst neighborhood in Minneapolis is much nicer than the average neighborhood in Columbus <laughs> or Cleveland. Yeah, you want a house, go to Cleveland, you can get one for a couple thousand bucks. Nice 1920s house in some of those neighborhoods. Uh, those cities are much more diverse, much more ethnically diverse. They have been for 100 years. Uh, homes boarded up, uh, roofs caving in, rough neighborhoods. We'd uh, serve food uh, at missions in some of the rough neighborhoods. And, uh, and, and really tough. And um, when we were there, there was over 5,000 abandoned homes that nobody owned. And the cities didn't have enough money to bulldoze them down. They're just caving in. And, and you know, here in Minneapolis, we say, oh, it's getting so bad, and we got to move out, and we got to get out of this city. And, you know, only back in the good old days when the you know, roughest things were tensions between the Norwegians and Swedes, whether or not to put cream sauce on their lutefisk, you know, and now our city's getting so rough and we got to move away, and, and, you know, we're really soft because I never heard that kind of talk in Ohio. That was their city, that was their town, they lived there, and what are you going to do? I'm getting a job in Columbus, you're going to move into Columbus? Yeah, moving into Columbus, and and, and the ministries and the Christians and the churches hanging on and moving forward and, 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 and saying, this city belongs to the Lord. And, and you, know, you, know the way we, you know the way we lose? We lose when we retreat. That's when we lose. We lose when we retreat. You know, I, I like, I'd like to hear people say, you know, maybe me. Uh, you know, there's some neighborhoods in Minneapolis that are starting to get a little rough, places where I grew up and used to be so nice. You know, I think I better move back there and see if I can make a difference. You know? Um, Jesus Christ is Lord. And rather than talking, we have to be honest about things that have been going on, about what's going on in Brooklyn Center or Brooklyn Park or, or, or Minneapolis, you know, on Lake Street or wherever it might be. Jesus Christ is Lord, and that's how we need to talk. That's how we need to speak, and that's how we need to act, and that's how we need to live out our life. And if we're not going to live there, at least go there and be there and talk with people and volunteer at the Marie Sandick Center where they're just hanging in there and moving on. And, and during all those riots, they didn't even get any spray paint on their building. None. Because the people knew that all that came from that building was the love of God. So let's, let's try. It's hard. But we're soft. We're used to having it so What's, what's our Minnesota word? Nice. And when things aren't nice, we get negative. And let's stay positive. And let's, this belongs to Christ. This belongs to God. Every last square inch of it. And let's talk that way, act that way, give that way, volunteer that way, and do things to put it that direction so that we can regain territory that has been lost to evil and anger and, and fighting and rioting and stuff like that. And, uh, and I've qu quoted many times, the last time there was rioting, the black pastor from South Minneapolis said, quit talking about us and get down here and help me tell people about Jesus because that's the need. That's the need. Don't just talk about it. Get down there, help me tell people about Jesus. Battle's not lost. The battle is won, has been won, and forever will be won. And let's uh, 
operate from a position of victory and an attitude of victory rather than one of defeat because Minneapolis at its worst is still one of the nicest cities in the entire United States. Beautiful, beautiful. No houses tumbling down, caving in, uh, massive amounts of people squatting all over and so forth. No, it still is a tremendous place and let's talk as if it's that way and pray as if it's that way and support the positive movement in that direction or back in that direction. We're gonna look at the hireling versus the shepherd today, John 10, 11 through 18. But before we do that, I wanna just ask you to reflect for just one second. Um, as we look back in our lives, at the positive influences that we have had spiritually in our lives, the people that have really made a difference, what are they like? What were those or are those people like that have really made a difference? Were they highly educated? Maybe. Did they have a great and deep knowledge of Scripture? Hopefully, but not always. I think there's two things that really make a difference in people who point us in the right direction and shepherd us in a good direction. And number one is you see in them a real and living relationship with God. A real deep and living relationship with the Lord. And then the second thing that is a characteristic of people in my life that have made a real positive difference is you really sense that they care for you. They care for you. They care that you know the Lord personally. They care that you grow in your faith, but they care about your life as a whole, your family, your children, you know, your, your career. They just care about you. They walk with God and they care about you. And those two are really the aspects of a, of a, good, of a good shepherd, of a good shepherd of sheep. And we see them so beautifully in Christ. But we have the contrast here in John 10, 11 through 18, of the hireling versus the good shepherd. And let's just dig into that for a moment and see what we can learn to that. You know, we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. We aren't the good shepherd. But what I like to say is this, we can be better shepherds. <laughs> I think all of us, I know all of us, even if you have the good shepherd in your heart, all of us still have a little bit of the hireling in us, you know, the self-centered, what's in it for me kind of thing. And so we all can grow and be better shepherds in our home, marriage, family, neighborhood, and so forth, but ultimately looking to the good shepherd. But let's look at the hireling first. And in John 10, 11 through 13, I see contempt, and I see the hireling fleecing the sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing about the sheep. Contempt. Contempt, oh, I gotta care for these stupid sheep. Fleecing the sheep, I just want to get paid. That's the main thing that I'm concerned about. You see, this is from chapters 9, 10, and 11, where the hirelings, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and all the religious professionals are just now jealous. The people feel the love of God through Christ. They're attracted to his warm uh, teaching that comes out of his personal relationship with the Father, and they're jealous of him, they're angry at him, and they're picking at him all the time, trying to find fault in him, trying to make him look bad, and their concern is not for the spiritual lives of the sheep, but their concern is just for their own position and power and, and prosperity. I remember so clearly Pastor Eldon Nelson telling us, he was former president of our denomination. Um, you know, I don't think he even had a co college education. He came to Christ late in life. He was a cattle truck driver, and they let him in the seminary without college, and he went on to become the president of our denomination. Uh, he was truly a, a good shepherd of souls. 
And Eldon said that when he came to know the Lord, he got on a music team with the Lutheran evangelistic movement, and they went all over the United States singing and testifying in Lutheran churches. And he said, we were all the way out in California. And he said, I went to this church, and this church was just dead. It was dead. There was no pastor to be seen. The people kind of came in, and no one was very friendly or greeting each other. And They were up there in the sacristy of the church, you know, waiting for the pastor to come and give them instructions of how they were to sing and what they were to do in the service. Finally, at the last minute, he came, and he said, excuse me, just a minute. He had to have one last cigarette, and he got that done with, and, and then they had the service, and, 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 and the pastor was just ready to leave. They said he didn't greet anybody before or after the service, and I don't know if he had a tea time on the golf course or what, but he wanted to get out of there fast. And Eldon was a young man fired up for the Lord and maybe feeling the call to the ministry, and he's also bold in his own way. And he stopped the pastor before he left. He says, could you tell me why you went into the ministry? And the pastor goes, oh, that's easy. He said, when I was looking for a job to do, I thought, what is the easiest job I could do and still get paid? And he thought, I'll become a pastor. <laughs> Just get the service done on Sunday and, you know, do what I want. And, and uh, Eldon never forgot. You know, that guy, one thing you can't say about him, he wasn't dishonest. He was honest. And, uh, and, and that is not a shepherd. That's someone who is fleecing the sheep. And um, I remember in my very first parish, uh, this one woman coming to me and, you know, so apologetically asking if I could go visit a neighbor or so forth. And, and uh, they're not a member of the church. Well, I said, that doesn't matter. Uh, they need the Lord. Well, great. Oh, they said, we had a pastor in our church once. Uh, my dad wasn't a member of the church because his little country church folded. It closed down, merged one in town. And, and here he was dying. He had no church or pastor. And I went to the pastor and said, would you go visit my dad? Well, he says, that's not my business. He's not a member of our church. He wasn't a member of any church. That's a hireling. That's a hireling. We don't want to be hirelings like them. We want to be people who truly love the sheep. A hireling is a hireling. Verse 12a, hireling is not a shepherd. A hireling is a hired hand. They want a job and they're in it just to get the money from that job. Some of you have worked with people like that. Wherever your career is, you know, teaching, engineer, um, you know, grocery store, whatever it is. You've worked with people who have de been dedicated, but you've worked with people who are hirelings, who get by with the least amount they can get by with, and you've worked with that before. And that's this kind of hireling, what they are. They don't do their best. They just get by with the minimum. And secondly, a hireling has no personal relationship with the shepherd. Verse 12b, the next words in 12. Not the shepherd who owns the sheep. They don't feel any sense of ownership. Just what's in it for me. No sense of ownership. Uh, they're not the shepherd. They're there to be fed, but not to help anybody else. And you know, you really miss out on something then. It's like the ancient prayer says, it's in giving that we receive. We had a man who was a member of our church in uh, Mineral Point, Wisconsin, a big, giant, six foot four uh, man, a uh, black man, and, and uh, he, he was always claiming we were so prejudiced and racist and, 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 and that uh, we weren't fair to him, and on and on he went. And I heard about after um, he moved to Texas, and I guess it wasn't any better in Texas, and then he moved back, and someone was telling me, the head usher was telling me, yeah, Greg's back, and I uh, said, you know what happened the other day? He says, Greg was standing, in the vestibule of the church with a sour look on his face, staring at people. You know, he was so big, he was scary, just his size alone. You know, he wasn't such a bad guy. Uh, we, we, we did a lot of things with him and tried to help him. He had a rough life. And, and he looked over at the head usher and he says, 
You people are racist. You people are prejudiced. No one here likes me. No one here greets me. And of course, the uh, head usher, Sharon, was Gene Schriefer. You remember him? You know, you know straight uh, 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 from New Jersey, and he was blunt. And he says, he says Greg, nobody's going to greet you. It has nothing to do with your skin color. You, you look terrible. You're crabby. He said, put a smile on your face, reach out your sand hand and say good morning, greet the next person who comes in by their first name, see what happens. All right. And he smiled, and, and he did have a nice smile. And he greeted that person, shook their hand. Oh, good morning, Greg. Nice to see you, <laughs> Gene. See? <laughs> And, uh, and, and it, it, he wasn't there for himself anymore. He was there to greet the other people. And what happened is it poured back the affection that he so desperately was desiring to have. Hireling has a, no personal relationship with the sheep. The hiring abandons the sheep when trouble comes. So when we see the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When trouble comes, there's no commitment abandons the sheep, uh, doesn't have personal ownership, doesn't feel bad, just wants to protect themselves. You know, remember Martin Rinkert who wrote, uh, Now Thank We All Our God? Um, he was pastor in what, at Eisenacht, Eisleben, Germany during the Thirty Years' War. The Black Plague came through, and he had an opportunity to take his family to a country estate and quarantine there until the plague passed. And he said, How can I leave? my congregation. I can't do it. He stayed, oftentimes having 45 burials a day. His wife died of the plague. His daughters died of the plague. He bathed, but he stuck there because his heart was for the sheep. You know, and when all the arguments and issues about COVID first came up, I think I said to Sharon once, should we just quit and move out to our little hobby farm and just stay there until it passes. And we couldn't. We couldn't leave. Couldn't do it. But when trouble comes, the hireling runs. The hireling doesn't care. They don't care. Verse 13, the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Cares nothing for the sheep. Um, when I got out of college, uh, I got a chance to get hired in the seventh highest paying school district in the United States. How do you like that? There was a chart one day and I counted down. Our school district was the seventh highest paying school district around here, starting salary for teacher at that time, 1982, was about $15,000 a year. And, um, up there was $27,000. And I took this job on, found out why they paid so much oil money, because it got to be 50 below zero in the winter. The school was, it was part native Alaskan and part white, and there was terrible tension between the whites and natives. And the white kids came from really rough homes. You know, that's where the Alaska pipeline is, all the welders and stuff. And they didn't know who their dads were. And the natives had their issues. And they were angry and hateful toward each other and had conflicting cultures. And the classrooms were chaotic and difficult and challenging. And I remember some of the teachers saying, grabbing their paycheck saying, this is why I keep on. And it's understandable, but one thing I discovered there is those children so desperately needed us. That school was the stable, steady place in their life. And not all the teachers were like that. Some of them had a heart for those kids. Uh, the assistant superintendent, he had a tremendous tremendous heart for those kids and poured into them and, and they needed love and they were so challenging. But um, I even had one teenager come and live with me because his family situation was so horrible. Gary Babbitt, he became my foster son for a while. And I look back on it now just thinking, uh, my goodness, the ones that are the hardest to care for are the ones who need us the most. The ones that are the hardest to care for 
are the ones who need us the most. Don't give up on your straying child, niece, nephew, neighbor, brother, sister. They need us the most. Don't give up. So what's going on in Minneapolis? We need shepherds. These people need shepherding. These are sheep without a shepherd. Uh, young men who have grown up, many of them without fathers, angry and bitter, uh, multi-generational welfare, and, and they need shepherding. And we need to say to ourselves, what can we do? And then in a positive side, here we see the good shepherd. The good shepherd described the one who loves, the one who feeds the sheep. Verses 14 through 17, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are now of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have lay, the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Notice here that the Good Shepherd has a personal relationship with the sheep. That's so key. Boy, it doesn't matter what business you're in, sales, uh, medical, uh, teaching, a personal relationship uh, with the sheep is just so important. The shepherd names them. He likes them. He treats their illness. He brings them to green pastures and quiet waters. My, my dad was a high school biology teacher, and I've probably told you before, sometimes if he had a difficult student, um, on Saturday, we would take our Saturday and we would go visit that difficult student in their home. Most of them were rural, and uh, many, many times he would take his Saturday and go visit a problem student in their home. I'll never forget it. And Oh, they'd show him their cows, they'd show him their guns, they'd show him their, where they lived, what they did, and, and uh, sometimes we went ice skating on their ponds and stuff. And, and, and you know, he found that after one visit, their, uh, pro their, uh, their dis d discipline problems went away. Just get to know them. Just get to know them. What a difference that makes. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. Going above and beyond. Uh, David was a good shepherd before he was a king. And remember, a bear came to attack the sheep, and with his bare hands he attacked the bear. And, and a lion came to kill his sheep, and he laid his life on the lion to kill the lion with his bare hands. Saul says, how are you going to kill Goliath? He says, I've killed a lion and a bear with my bare hands. I'm not scared of this guy. He lays down his life for the sheep. John 4.10 this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then, uh, fourthly, the Good Shepherd cares for the lost sheep. He cares for them. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. Going out and, and finding the one lost sheep, leaving the 99 behind, not, not in danger with the other helpers and stuff, but going out himself to look for that troublesome lost sheep. And our church council decided now that on 9-11, September 11th, 2021, Saturday, we are going to have a big picnic here. A big picnic. And we'll have some children's games and we'll have volleyball. And the next Sunday we're going to have a, a special service, a two-day event. And the purpose of this event is to go find those many, many, many people that have gone to church here or maybe you grew up with or whatever that have strayed away and aren't walking with the Lord. For Maybe they got bitter, maybe they got worldly. And, and we want to bring them back and bring them in and welcome them back. What a wonderful thing that would be to have a special reunion. And we're going to do the same thing at the little country church too. A special reunion. 
And it could be a reunion of former church members. It could be a reunion of someone you were in confirmation with in western Minnesota or wherever. And bring them back and bring them in. And many of them, after a life of struggle, are ready again to let the Lord into their heart and life. 9-11. Let's be in prayer for that. Uh, he cares for the lost sheep. And then the sheep know his voice and unites them. Verse 16b, they too listen to my voice and, and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. And what is it that unites us? And that's the voice of God, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. And as we gather around God's Word, He brings us together. Bible study, Sunday school, uh, I would even challenge you to invite neighbors over for something in your backyard and then just say, can I just have three minutes? Billy Graham says, keep it three minutes or less. And just tell them your testimony. Or say, boy, this Bible verse I've been reading has really been helping me. Keep it short. And, and, and just share the Word of God and let that draw people to Christ. And then finally, the Good Shepherd takes his commands from God the Father. This command I have received from my Father. And of course, what was the Father's command? To lay down his life on the cross for the sins of the world. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny, towards the lonely hill of Golgotha, where he laid down his life for you and me. If that isn't love, if that isn't love. And in closing, I have seven goals for my life that I got out of this passage. Number one, draw nearer to God through his word and prayer. Draw nearer to God. And secondly, take time to get to know each of you more personally. Take time to get to know you each more personally. I'm stealing Dave Ostis this afternoon uh, from his family, and uh, he's an engineer with the steam power boilers, and I'm going to have my steam boiler inspected tomorrow. I thought it'd be fun to have him along on that, but as we drive 125 miles together, what an opportunity we'll have to get to know each other more personally, and I hope we can do that many times. You know, invite me fishing so I can get to know you more personally. I'd love that. I'm going to do that with Gary and Nate next Wednesday as well. And, uh, you know, it kind of sounds like foolishness and fooling around, but, you know, as we get to know each other more personally, it pulls the whole church together. As we do that in simple ways with one another. And then get... People around the Word of God, that's where our unity comes as we gather around the Word, namely, especially our worship service. Another goal is listen to God's leading for our fellowship. Jesus did what the Father told him, and not coming to the church council with my ideas or Carol's ideas or, or, or you know, Dave Fugelberg's ideas, but for us to come with a sense, I think the Lord put this idea on my heart, trying to listen to God's leading and not our own. And then be faithful with a few people and expect God to increase a healthy flock. Healthy sheep reproduce. And then finally, give thanks to the Lord because Jesus gave his life for you and for me. Some of the best leaders that I have ever known whose lives have borne so much fruit really don't have all that many gifts. But they do have one thing in common. They know how to spell love. They know how to spell love. And they've learned that love is spelled T-I-M-E. It's all about relationships. That's what makes for being a good shepherd. Oh, may we be a good and shepherding congregation in this needy, needy world. Amen. Shall we sing together hymn number five? Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.